Welcome to Sportscaster News. I'm Lawrence Owen, and with me today on the early run is Joe Nubo. That's Welcome. right. <laughs> All right. So we got an interesting topic today. We're going to be talking about offensive linemen, and I really like that we have Joe Nubo here with me today on the early stream because, quite frankly, uh, the Indianapolis Colts are known for their offensive line. Joe mm-hmm. Nubo, obvi- obviously, the Ravens are known for their offensive line as well. So this is going to be good information from a couple people who cover teams that have great offensive lines. Mm-hmm. Um, starting the story off today, there was a def- assistant defensive coach that came out and said, Let's see here. He said that after the Pittsburgh game last year, that he'll never look at Quentin Nelson the same again because Cameron Hayward, in his own words, simply just manhandled uh, Quentin Nelson Mm -hmm. and that he won't ever look at him the same. And then Mm -hmm. that was an assistant coach. And Cameron Hayward had a had a response for that. And he's like, man, I'm, I'm not down with that. Uh, so because I have a good game, it devalues a great talent due yeah. to the heck of a talent. How, how, how about I'm a great player and we won the game. Mm-hmm. I know Q is a dog and I know it's a five-star matchup every time we line up. What are your thoughts on, on this whole situation that's been going down with this? I, I mean, I got to agree, man. I think I actually agree with Cam Hayward because – as a Ravens fan, we have to go up against that D line and Cam Hayward twice a year. So I know exactly, you know, what kind of force Cam Hayward can be. He can absolutely wreck games. So it, it feels like a backhanded compliment. It feels like almost like that uh, assistant defensive coordinator. And it's like, why do you have to stay anonymous when you say these things? Just come out and say who you are so you can, you know, it, it just feels like a cop out when you're like, oh, I'm an anonymous, you know, player or coach in the. In the NFL, I'm not going to say who I am, but I am going to put out a take there. It's ridiculous. It's a backhanded compliment. You're basically saying, oh, Cam Hayward destroyed him. So since Cam Hayward is not that good, you know, Quentin Nelson is not that good. That's how I felt like it came out. And I just don't agree with that. I think both of these players are insanely good. Some of the top of their, you know, of their positions, Quentin Nelson, obviously he was drafted, what, six overall. Um, and for good reason. He's obviously been an amazing guard. There's nothing wrong with having, you know, one, I don't want to say a bad game, but one not as, you know, shut down as you're used to seeing Quentin Nelson as being. But you're going up against Cam Hayward, one of the best defensive linemen in the league. You know, I, I just, this is an absolutely stupid compliment or compliment, stupid comment. And I am glad that Cam Hayward actually came out and said, no, come on, you're an idiot, straight up. And it, it is true. I agree. I think that that's totally just idiotic. And, uh, you know, sometimes good players just get get theirs and uh, nothing you can really do about it. You know, I mean, like, for example, I I have to see uh, Miles Garrett and he he gets his every now and again, even though we have Ronnie Stanley, who's amazing um, and he plays great throughout the whole season. But sometimes, you know, he'll get him. He'll get a pressure or maybe a quarterback hit on him. So. It happens, man. You know, like these offensive linemen have to play. They're on the field pretty much every single offensive snap, right? Unless they're injured. So, you, I mean, one slip up or two slip ups a game, that doesn't make them a bad player. So this is just, I, I mean, it's a stupid comment straight up. I, I have to agree. And I mean, to be fair, like you said, they're on the field every snap of every game unless they're injured. And, and you can't be... 100% dominant every snap of every game throughout every year that you play. You're going to have moments where you're out there not doing your best. And it has nothing to do against you. You could be trying your best. Maybe you're ill. Maybe, you know, your mind is on something else. Some uh, Something took your mind off because you see a guy pulling around or doing a, um, you know, a switch or something. So many things can happen. And, Sometimes you're just playing against really great players and it's a heck of a matchup, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So to say, oh, you know, just because he had one bad game, I I can't see him in the same light as what I used to is, is I agree. Stupid, stupid comment. And, and and after saying that, 
you still go look at his stats and he still didn't give up a sack. <laughs> you know, yeah. he gave up a couple pressures mm -hmm. and, and, and to be fair, it's that play. Like I said earlier, he pushed Quentin Nelson back into Jacoby Brissett, yeah. which in turn hurt his knee. It happens. And Nelson felt terrible about that. And after that, it was just like a, a, a rampage after that. The rest of the season, it was nasty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> obviously, I, that got into Quentin Nelson's head that he got manhandled. Right. <laughs> it's funny because I actually, a few years ago, Joe Flacco got injured. And I know, you know, the meme is that I bring up Joe Flacco every stream. But this is actually relevant to this topic because Joe Flacco had a similar thing happen to him. He tore his ACL because one of his offensive linemen got pushed back, James Hurst, who, if you guys follow me personally, I hate James Hurst, and I'm glad he's not on the Ravens anymore. But this guy, he had to come in, and he got manhandled. He got pushed back and tore Joe's ACL. I never forgave James Hurst, but also because he's a bad player. But if James Hurst was a good offensive lineman like Quentin Nelson is, and that happened, I probably wouldn't have been as pissed at him because it's like it happens. You know, it's something you can't stop. So... But yeah, if if Quentin Nelson was like James Hurst, who is just getting beat every single game, cannot block anybody, then it would be different, right? <laughs> so. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So uh, on the line of talking about Quentin Nelson, something else came out uh, in the media just today, mm -hmm. and I well yesterday actually, and I wanted to bring it up, and I wanted your thoughts as well about this. So Chris Ballard is talking about Quentin Nelson saying, you know, how a rare competitor he is. And he said that um, he's, he's as good a teammate as he's ever seen in terms of caring for other players, wanting them to do well and his passion for the game. And he said that one practice before the Kansas city chiefs game, um, the Colts interior defensive line had a lot of injuries on it. So they had to send defensive ends in that position and these are like 230, 240 pound defensive linemen and Quentin Nelson's practicing against them. And this is getting ready for the Kansas city chiefs game. Right. And he said that we had all those injuries and Nelson comes running up to him and sprinting up to him and says, what the F Ballard, we are playing against Chris Jones and you have a 230 pound defensive end across from me. Yeah. How the heck am I supposed to get better? And then he ran back and, you know, all the players and coaches' eyes are all huge because he just basically <laughs> cursed out the boss's boss, the guy that can fire him at, at right. will or, or something of that nature. And, that I mean, obviously that shows Quentin Nelson's competitiveness, right? He wants to be challenged every not, – not only during games, but during practices. And – he, he he's calling out Ballard saying, Hey, I need, I need people here to challenge me so yeah. that I can get better. But he did it rather flamboyantly. And in front of all the players and coaches, do you think Nelson was in the right for doing that? Sure. Well, I'm actually curious how you feel about this as a Colts fan yourself. So we'll obviously get to hear your take, but my personal take from an outsider's perspective, um, Obviously, there's two sides to every story. I personally like what Quentin Nelson did because, I mean, think about it. You're the best offensive lineman on the team, right? Arguably one of the top five offensive linemen in the league in Quentin Nelson. The GM drafted him, what, number six overall in that draft. So obviously, there's a lot of value in him. They they obviously put a lot of stock into Quentin Nelson, Um and he knows that. I'm sure he knows that. He's like, they're not going to cut me so I can pretty much, you know, do what I want, say what I want. But, you know, to be respectful as, as you can. But obviously he was frustrated because he knew he had a big challenge coming up against Chris Jones and the Chiefs. And he wanted to be challenged in practice. And the fact of the matter is the GM obviously didn't put a, enough defensive line depth, you know, for practice or really just in general. Because obviously if this is a problem... I don't think Quentin Nelson just came out and said this. I think this is something that he's been feeling for a while. At least that's kind of what I would think if I was in his shoes. He's probably like, okay, yeah, we have good defensive line, but what happens when some of them get injured? We don't have the depth. We don't have any challenges here. I need to be challenged. I need to be a better player. So I, 
kind of am on the side of Quentin Nelson here. But also from the side, you got to think about it. You know, the GMs have to deal with the cap space, so maybe they don't want to put as much, you know, stock into the defensive line. Maybe they're more focused so on the linebackers or the secondary or however your defense is built, right? So, I mean, obviously there's two sides to every story, but I personally, I don't have a problem with what Quentin Nelson did. I mean, he knows that there's stock in him. They, he knows that there's value in him. So he feels like he has the right to say something. So that's how I feel about it. Well, my opinion is twofold on this. One, he didn't do it on like actual media, like in front of media so that it would get blown up. You know, he wasn't telling CBS or NFL.com or, or sports center or something like that. This, so this was a in practice type situation. Yes. It was around players and other coaches and stuff, but it was still, you know, in the group of just basically locker room type situation. And I, I think that this is a leadership type role that he he pulled off here, right? This is showing that he's ready to step in and be that leader on the offensive line. And when he sees something that needs to be addressed, he should have the right to run up and say something, mm -hmm. right? Especially when you got all these other offensive linemen that are looking up to him as a role model. I mean, yes, they're playing beside him, but they're still, he's the role model. He's, he's that, that tier they want to reach and, and get to. So I think that something like that, he should absolutely be allowed to do that without fear of retribution from the GM. Mm -hmm. And I believe the GM, Chris Ballard, I think he not only heard what he said, but took it to heart. Because what happened a few months later after the season was over, he went out and got DeForest Buckner. There you go. He played there you right go. across mm -hmm. from Quentin Nelson. Now he's got one of the best in the NFL. To you you want to challenge Quentin? Here you go. <laughs> That's right. So yeah. not only, not only did, did Quentin Nelson's outburst have a positive effect and get what he wanted, but he also made the defense better in doing so. So it was twofold. It's able to make him better and other offensive linemen right. better. And plus it makes the defense better. So things like this can have a very positive outcome when your bosses take it as a, positive criticism rather than a negative criticism. I agree. There's, it actually reminds me of a story that came out with uh, Ray Lewis right before, I think it was the year we before we drafted Haloti Nada. And uh, if you know who that is, he is an am amazing defensive lineman, one of the most underrated Ravens of all time. Um, he actually came out and he, he told the GMs in the front office, he's like, you guys need to get me a defensive lineman. I need help up front. Straight up, Ray Lewis told him straight up, I cannot do this by myself. I need a big boy up front. Then they went out and got Haloti Nada, and then the defense became well again. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes when you are, you know, a player that you know that the team is invested in you and, you know, you have a right to say stuff because it's obvious, you know, you're one of their star players. You should be able to not necessarily make decisions, but at least tell – you know, I'm on there. I'm on the field. I know what will make this team better. So do this, right? So, I mean, yeah, I, I like it. Another thing about Quentin Nelson that is pretty wide known right now is how he treats his fellow players, right? I mean, there's so many highlights of him just after a, a running play, right? Where, you know, the Marlon Mack is tackled 25, 30 yards downfield after a big run. He's the first guy there to pick him up off the field, mm -hmm. right? You, you see this all the time. Uh, he's also, uh, it was it was brought up that, you know, when the Pro Bowl voting came in and Chris Ballard and Frank Reich said, hey, they called him up and said, hey, you were voted into the Pro Bowl. You know what his reaction was right off the bat? Mm. It wasn't, oh, that's cool. It was, well, what about Anthony Costanzo? Did he get in? Oh, really? Wow. What about uh, Ryan Kelly? Did he get in? They mm. both deserve to get in. He wasn't worried about himself. He was worried about the guys beside Helpless. him. Yeah. Exactly. And in today's NFL, in today's NFL where it's all me, 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 this is a refreshing thing to see. Someone who is team-oriented, who's worried, who's more worried about the guys beside him yeah. than his own personal stuff. And um, so do you have any any stories like that that, that uh, about players or anything that you know of from the well, Ravens? I mean, obviously, Quentin Nelson's a true leader, right? And I mean, I don't – 
it's it's funny because this this Ravens team usually you'll see well just just from what I've I've experienced as a Ravens fan usually you'll see those leaders step up when we have some tough losses or we're kind of going through a rough patch right but I mean last year we only had two losses so it's like we didn't really have that need for someone to step up and you know pick everybody up I mean I think it was after we we had because we had lost back to back to the Chiefs and then to the Browns that's when you started seeing some of the older people like Brandon Williams came out and Earl Thomas. I mean, I know everybody has their opinions on Earl Thomas, but yeah, we, it was always Terrell Suggs, man. That was always the guy, but since he's not there anymore, I don't know. We're, we're a young team with some veterans mixed in there. I think that Calais Campbell will be a huge leader this year. So that's going to be a huge help. Um, But yeah, man, I do think that that leadership role by Terrell Suggs was desperately missed last year because we didn't – I mean, it's nice to win and everything, but I, I don't think that we knew, especially going into the playoffs, we didn't have that, like, Terrell Suggs who's been there for a while. He he, he would have had everybody in line and say, focus on this game. I don't care if it's the 9-7 the and seven Titans. I don't care who we're playing. This is serious. So, I don't know, man. It, it, that's one thing that was lacking last year, but I do think, like I said, with Calais Campbell, that'll be huge, no doubt. Oh, absolutely. I have a ton of respect for Calais Campbell being that, you know, AFC South, he came from the Jags and the Colts played him twice a year. I loved Calais Campbell. He's a good man. There was many times where I've I've watched him get into the Colts backfield and wrap up Andrew Luck. And instead of just throwing him down or or dropping him, he'd just throw him in a bear hug and just hold him there. Lightly. (laughs) Yeah. You know, just be like, I got you, dude. You ain't going nowhere. And then the whistle (laughs) would blow and and luck would tap him on the hat, you know, or something like that. Because a guy that's his size, I mean, he's a monster, right, on the D-line. If he would use his body weight and his size and strength and and hit a quarterback the way he could, and and a lot of people say should, he could seriously do a lot of damage. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. So uh, he's so fast getting off the snap too. That's the thing that's so dangerous about him. Yeah. So you you definitely got a really good leader and a, and a great player in Campbell, especially for what a fifth round pick is what the right. trade was. Right. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Wow. Um, I know. <laughs> Shout but, out to Eric DeCosta. But, um, <laughs> no, I, I'm actually interested, man, because I know that your offensive line last year actually, I think you've said it many times, they stayed fully healthy through all 16 games. Correct. Yeah. So are you a bit concerned that if they can't repeat that, like, do you have good offensive line depth? So would you say I was worried about it, especially when a couple of the players um, left. Yeah, Uh, we we ended up losing our backup center, which I loved a lot. We ended up losing um, uh, Joe Haig, who was a Swiss Army knife on the offensive line. He could play all three positions. Uh, center guard or tackle, very good at it. He, he ended up leaving the team as well. However, they went up and they they grabbed a couple people, especially in the draft. I think Pinter will be a, a, a good player once he establishes himself. Uh, I think the depth could get better. I think they could have went out and got another tackle um, because Pinter, I, I believe, is going to be a guard who I think will end up uh, with – uh, fighting with Mark Glowinski for the right guard spot. Hmm. But uh, Anthony Costanzo right now obviously is uh, nearing the end of his career. You know, he, he was actually thinking about uh, retiring this past season. Then he signed a two-year extension. But I think the Colts need to find someone who can who can take over in, in, on that left tackle position. Yeah. Um, but – since he signed a two-year extension, I think they have at least maybe next year they'll they'll find a, a replacement for him and then let him sit behind Costanzo, uh, his rookie season and learn a little bit from him. Yeah. Um. So what what about you? No, yeah, I'm 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 interested to see how uh, you know I've been saying it how Philip Rivers will play behind an actually good offensive line. That's something that I'm very curious to see because, I mean, I don't know when the last time he had a good offensive line on the Chargers was. I don't think he ever did, but. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that turns out, especially if they can all stay healthy throughout the whole season like they did last year. But no, I mean, the Ravens are kind of in a similar situation, man. I mean, obviously the big news coming out of the offensive line was Yanda retiring. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, he's been the cornerstone at right guard for such a long time, been one of the best right guards in the league um, his whole career. So that's, I think that's a huge loss. But we did bring in DJ Fluker, who obviously not as good as Yanda, but I don't think that there'll be a huge fall off, you know, if we were just to play a rookie or a free agent, but, or an undrafted free agent, right? So I think Fluker could come in and play solid football. He's very good at blocking for run, run, uh, you know, he's going to fit our system very well. And uh, aside from that, I mean, we kind of have a battle going on with uh, the center position and left guard a little bit. I think that uh, Bradley Bozeman played left guard last year and he was decent enough. And I, I would be fine if he was our starter again. Um, but we did draft uh, Tyree Phillips, who I guess could be backup tackle or interior. We also drafted Ben Bredesen out of Michigan. Um, so we it's kind of a little battle there going on in the interior. But obviously, I mean, don't have to say anything about the tackles. Ronnie Stanley, one of the best left tackles in the league, if not the best left tackle in the league. Orlando Brown, also very good on that right side. So I think the offensive line will be fine, especially when you have a quarterback like Lamar Jackson who can just, you know, get out of trouble by himself. So I think our line will be fine, but I definitely don't think it's, you know, top five anymore, I wouldn't say, especially now with the loss of Yanda. So that's how I feel. I wanted to go back a little bit about your whole um, leadership thing and not really needing it uh, so much last year because you felt that, you know, you, you could use it only when you're in losses. In my opinion, I think leadership when you're in a winning streak is also a big deal because there are those times when you have letdown games, right? Yeah. Um, I think that you need those guys who have been there, done that, and know, hey, we got to stay focused, even though we're on a, a streak right now. And yeah, we're going up against the Bengals or something yeah. or the Jacksonville Jaguars. And we just won five straight. We just beat Kansas city, you know, right. and we're going up against the jets. Uh, you got to have those guys that can keep your team focused and not think ahead and think about, Hey, they these guys are professionals for a reason. They're in the NFL for a reason. Mm -hmm. They are good. They can win. Uh, we got to be at the top of our a game at all times. You need guys like that on your team even even when you're doing well, not just when you're <laughs> yeah, not, not no, just when you're losing. Ab absolutely, I agree. And like I said, that was one of our biggest issues last year because especially offensively, we are so young on the offensive side. I mean, obviously you have Lamar, who I think is a good leader, but he's more so, you know, I feel like he's one of the guys, you know what I mean? And he's not I mean, he'll he'll come out and scream at somebody if he needs to, but I feel like he's more so like I'm just going to ball out and you guys can follow me, right? That, that's how I feel like Lamar leads. and uh, But really, you had Mark Ingram, who was the leader on the offensive side of the ball, I would say, last year. But the problem was, going into that playoff game, he was hurt. He only got three carries. Um, I mean, you know, he you could definitely see that his spirits were low. So I, I just felt like, you know, the offense wasn't feeling it. Um, and the defensive side, we didn't really have that leader. Like I said, with the departure of Terrell Suggs, we didn't – I mean, obviously I know the argument has been made that Earl Thomas is supposed to be that guy, but I've also always said that I don't think he is that guy necessarily. I think he's just kind of his own person and he says his own things. Um, but like I said, with the addition of Calais Campbell, I think that'll absolutely solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. We should have had somebody come out and say, look, I know we're coming off a huge 12-game win streak, and I know we're just facing against the Titans. We're kind of looking ahead. We have to, we may have to face the Chiefs in the AFC Championship. That's probably what they were thinking about. Um, and, yeah, if we had that leadership to, to just, you know, tell Lamar, like, focus, man. This is not just any other game. We have to get into it, man. You know, like, yeah, it probably could have helped them a lot more. But, yeah, I totally agree. I think you're right. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about offensive linemen in the NFL, who we believe the actual best offensive linemen at their specific positions are. Sure. Uh, tackle, guard, center. Uh, I, I'm not going to go, you know, left or right. I'm just going to go with the three general tackle, okay. the guard, and the center. Um, so who do you think are the two best tackles in the NFL right now? Okay. Let me just let me preface this that I'm sorry if I forget somebody because 
Apologies that I don't know every offensive lineman's name in the league. Okay, I'm sorry, but I don't. Um, but obviously, I think the first name that comes to mind, call me biased, but it is Ronnie Stanley. He's been amazing. Last year, he was an all-pro, first-team all-pro, great season. Um, a lot of people argue it's because we don't necessarily, because of the way we play, the way we run is the reason that he's so good. But I don't think that's the case. I mean, this guy goes up against some, I mean, Miles Garrett. We have to face up against the Steelers, you know, with TJ Watt and all those guys. So, I mean, Ronnie Stanley is super solid, man. He is a rock and he absolutely deserves to be paid, which I think he will be very soon. So I would put Ronnie Stanley for sure in one of the slots. Now, for the other one, this gets a little tricky because, like I said, I would have to think about it like every single team. Um, but hmm, I think the one that's coming to mind would either be the one from the Saints. Um, is it uh, – I think it's Terrett Armstead or Ramchick. One of those Ramchick. two. Ryan yeah, Ramchick. Ryan Ramchick. Those, those two are very good. Um, and also the Cowboys, uh, you have Lyle yeah. Collins, right? And, Lyle uh, Collins and Tyron Smith. Tyron Smith. So it would be one of those guys. I'm not necessarily sure who I would put there, but definitely those are the names that come to mind for me. All right. So I am going to agree with you that I would put Ronnie Stanley in the top two. Okay. Uh, if not the best, at least second best, especially over the last couple of years. I think that Stanley has just been an absolute stud at left tackle for Baltimore. And I think he really anchors and, and personifies what Baltimore wants to do on that offensive line. Um, now, Kansas City's right tackle, Schwartz, mm -hmm. is actually pretty solid as well. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, Tennessee has Taylor Lewan. That's He's right. also very, very good as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to have to agree, even though I, I think I'll go with Tyron Smith. I know last year he had his injuries. He's 29. He only played, I think, 13 games last season and that because of injuries. But injuries happen, right? Uh, so it just – they happen to people at times. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're worse for wear. Now, if that happens year in, year out, then obviously that's going to knock you down. But Tyron doesn't normally uh, have injuries on a consistent basis. I think Tyron should be up in the, the, the top three, if not – right there with Stanley as well. Um, so those are my top two, Tyron Smith and and Ronnie Stanley. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think I agree with you, and I think maybe Saints fans will have a problem with that because anytime you bring up tackles, oh, don't forget about Ramchick or Armstead, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I like them. I like yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I, like I said, I named a few others off on, on that list as well that could easily be put inside that, that conversation. Right. Guards. Who are you talk, taking as your top two? All right, so this one's interesting as well. I think for sure just with the the youth and the the way he plays is Quentin Nelson for sure. I would definitely put him in one of the spots. I mean, if I was taking guards, I would de he would be one of the first ones I would take. Also, let's see. I mean, you have some good guards. I'm actually – I had to look it up just to remind – refresh myself. You have Brandon Brooks, who's pretty decent. I know he's injured this year, but uh, – um, David DeCastro, funny story about David DeCastro. I think there was a Steelers fan last year on Twitter who told me, oh, he's a better football player than Marshall Yonda. And then uh, that just like pissed me off. But anyway, that's totally out of out of context here. But I'm trying to find the, the name of that, that, that guard from the Cowboys because I know he's very good as well. Zach Martin. There you go, Zach Martin. He's probably who I would take as well. That, so those would be my two. But, I mean, obviously there's a lot of good guards in the NFL, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, call me biased. I'm putting Quentin Nelson number one. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm i a Colts fan. What can you say? Uh, kind of similar situation with you on Stanley on the, on the tackle position. But at the same time, I've, I've got the stats to back it up, right, just like you do. Um, there are a lot of guards, like you say. Brandon Brooks from Philadelphia is very solid. Joe Thune. Can't, can't take him out of the, the equation. You know, Brandon Sheriff from Washington, uh, DeCastro, as you said. Um, yeah, but I'm going to have to agree with you on the, uh, Zach Martin for the Cowboys. Again, uh, he has he was no exception with the whole injury issue last year on the offensive line. He had his share of injuries as well. But when you're talking about someone who just year in, year out comes out and just balls 
at the guard position. Zach Martin is is that guy. So I, I'm put him at number two as well. So last but not least, let's talk about centers in the NFL. Yes, sir. So it's funny because I'm I'm actually looking at a list here, and they have Marquise Pouncey at number one, which I totally disagree with because he had a terrible year last year for Steeler. And even if you're a Steelers fan, you have to agree with me. Marquise Pouncey was not playing his best football. I don't know if he was injured. I don't know what's going on there. But if that is the case, I don't think he's one of the best centers in the league, at least not currently. I'm sorry. So I don't know why they have him at number one. I would still put, I mean, number two, they have Jason Kelsey. I would agree with that. I think Jason Kelsey, if not the best center in the league, definitely one of the top two, at least in my eyes. Um, Travis Frederick, obviously. I mean, the Cowboys just have that stud offensive line. Rodney Hudson is another one. But uh, if I had to choose, I would probably say Jason Kelsey and uh, and uh, uh, Travis Frederick. That would be my... My choices, man. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's 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 fair enough. I like Jason Kelsey. I think he's incredibly solid. There was Rodney Hudson from the from the Raiders last year was actually incredibly good. He gave up zero sacks and only three pressures the entire season. Yeah, he's great. All right. So, but one season doesn't make you the best in the NFL. This is something that I go over all the time uh, with people. Just because a player has one great season doesn't make you the best in the NFL. That just means you had an exceptional season. Right. Uh, you, you need consistency to be able to say you are the top in the NFL at that, at, at that position. So I'm not putting him number one. I am going to put Kelsey at number one because Kelsey just year in, year out, like we, we've talked about. Yep. Comes out and just plays and balls, right? Mm. Um, you got Eric McCoy for the Saints. Mm. Very, mm. very solid. And Mitch Morse for the Buffalo Bills is also sure. very good. I'm going to throw a little bit of biasness in here. I think Ryan Kelly should be number two okay. for the Colts. Uh, he had his injury issues his second year. But last year, again, he played balled out. Every time he plays, he does great. He gave up one sack last season. Mm -hmm. uh, gave up, uh, I think, 15 total pressures the entire year as a center, which is very, very good. But what makes him so good is the fact that he's so smart. He's able to break down. He, if the quarterback behind him misses something, he will turn around and say, hey, look, you know, mm -hmm. you uh, adjustments needs to be made yeah. and because of what I'm seeing. And he works with his guards as well. He's so good at getting to a second level, passing blocks off to guards and getting to the second level in the run game. Uh, I love what Ryan Kelly brings. He's also very young. Um, been around. He's been around only since 2016. But he was a first rounder as well, wasn't he? Yeah, 16th yeah. pick. He was actually the 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 last first round pick of the Ryan Grigson era. And in mm -hmm. my opinion was one of the best picks Ryan Grigson ever done, yeah. ever done. And then he lo lost his job and uh, Chris Ballard inherited Ryan Kelly. Um, <laughs> the offensive coach, offensive line coach that came from Philadelphia and talked about Ryan Kelly said that Ryan Kelly was the smartest center he has ever coached. And that says something – because we just got done talking about Jason Kelly for the Philadelphia Eagles or Jason Kelsey. So to Impressive. say that Kelly is that smart says a lot. And that's why I think it's not just physical ability. It's up here. Yeah. And I think Kelly, Kelly personifies the intelligence to go along with being a center. So I, I, that's, that's why I would put Kelly there. That's fair. I mean, like I said, if, you know, I'm not a big, watcher of offensive linemen i gotta be honest with you i don't really always pay attention unless they're getting beat every play then that's when i'll point them out you know but yeah I, kn I know that like my guy coach evans on youtube he's a big offensive line you know guy i think he's that's what he coaches because he's an actual coach um so obviously there's other guys that are much bigger into offensive linemen that could debate you but i just <laughs> i i'll have to agree with you man i think that's fine ryan kelly is obviously a good center um, so, you know, it is what it is. 
Something that I think that uh, the Ravens need to, to dive into, you talk about they got great tackles. Mm-hmm. I think I think they need to really get their center. They, they need to get their entire inside right. figured, figured out, out solid. Because, I mean, the style of offense that they play, that's where all of your run blocking and, and stuff comes from. So you definitely need to have uh, your guards and your center being really, really good. Tackles aren't as important when you have a quarterback that can step up and then take off, you know, right. and, and there's not a quarterback in the NFL that personifies that better than Lamar Jackson. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. And, and center is actually a position that I am a little concerned about. I can't lie to you because last year we had Matt Skura, who's an undrafted free agent, and he was playing extremely well. I think a lot of that has to do with our offensive line coaching. We just always know how to, you know, improve everybody's play. But he got hurt against the Rams. And then uh, Patrick McCarry, who was an undrafted rookie last year, came in and he played well. He actually played pretty solid um, up until the Titans game where he was just getting dismantled. But I mean, the Titans have an amazing defensive line, so it's to be expected. Uh, so center is a little bit of a concern if Matt Skura is not fully healthy because he pretty much tore his ACL, his PC, every CL you can imagine, all in one play, man. So hopefully he's ready to come back. He has been working out. We've seen videos of him, and he looks like he's ahead of schedule. So hopefully if he can come back and be the starting center, that'd be great. Um, I have my co-host on my podcast, which I know we're not supposed to mention, but he he doesn't believe that Matt Skura will be the starting center. He actually thinks that last year's left guard, Bradley Bozeman, will be our starting center because he used to play center at Alabama. So I don't know. We'll see. I think we'll be fine. I don't think it's going to be that big of a problem, but I do think we're going to see a little bit of a drop-off, especially because Yanda's not there anymore. And I think Yanda was such a huge piece because he would coach up the young guys, right? So if you had an undrafted rookie center right next to him, he could coach him up a little bit. He'd be like, come on, like, let's go, you know, whatever. Um, so that's going to be a problem because now you're going to have DJ Fluker there, who is obviously a veteran, but he's not, you know, he hasn't been a Raven for the longest time. So he doesn't necessarily know the the culture that much. So it's a little bit of a concern for me, but I think since we have that type of quarterback, we should be okay. Thanks everybody who's watching this. And until next time with Sportscaster News, I'm Lawrence Owen. Uh, that's Joe Nubo. And until next time, have a good one. See you later. Just because a guy's a player is not a household name doesn't mean we can't make him a household name.